in the <coughs> beliefs of the Intercontinental Church of God, and it is the Sabbath. And I'll give the scriptures that they give in the printout first. <laughs> Genesis 2, 2 and 3 says that the Sabbath was in effect created, uh, in effect God thought things out before he created the universe. So the, the, the Sabbath is uh, older than the universe because he created the Sabbath before he planned everything, before he did anything. In Genesis 2, 2 and 3, I just read it so I don't skip anything. It says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that ended he had rested from all of his work which God created and made. So God set the example. He didn't ask us to do what he didn't do. He set the example by doing it first. Then go to verse 29. Excuse me, we're in Exodus now, 16, 29. Israel refused to keep God's Sabbath. So go to Exodus 16 and 29, and it will tell you. I'll get there. Exodus 16, verse 28, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? In verse 29, See, for that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide every man in his place, let no man get out of his place on the seventh day. So God had already set the example. So again, mentioned last week in the Ten Commandments, I mean the last time I spoke, with the Ten Commandments, Mr. Ted Armstrong in his classes. And he announced this when I was out there. I heard him say it personally. Before he uh, would give a class in systematic theology, he would ask the students, go to your Bible and prove ever before they got to Mount Sinai that all Mount Sinai, that all Ten Commandments were in effect before they got to Mount Sinai. Because one of the kings wanted to sleep with the, one of the wives and said, well, why would you bring the sin on me? So again, the commandments were in effect before they got to Mount Sinai. So in effect, it couldn't be the Jewish laws and so forth. These are God's laws. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Exodus 20. These are just things that uh, you just want to kind of keep in mind when you think about the Sabbath. Exodus 20, starting verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So I'm not needing songs this week, but I'm giving you the Ten Commandments anyway. <laughs> so again, Exodus 32, when you read that, God was going to destroy the Israelites. But I keeping his word. And later you see that he, he gave him punishment, but you see in Exodus 32, God had already made up his mind. I'm just going to destroy them, and I'll start a whole new nation with your offspring. And after Moses talked with God, God changed his mind. That's what it says. In Exodus 32, it said God changed his mind because of Moses. Because he was going to create a new nation from Moses. He had a 32, 27, 28. 
we're looking to read it all, but still, God decided not to destroy man, but to uh, have mercy and so forth. So, again, in Luke 4, verse 16, and this is uh, Christ's example, Luke 4, verse 16. And it reads, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. So Christ set the example here. He kept the Sabbath himself. He didn't ask us to do what he didn't do. So again, now, as I mentioned, at 50 years ago is when I started keeping the Sabbath. I memorized my plain truth number. It was 6505010144. May 1st, 1965, number 141, uh, is when I went on the uh, plain truth. And that was the uh, time I started keeping the Sabbath day. Now, there were other things involved where you really lost two jobs. I had a good job at Chrysler. And I'd ask that I get off to work on the... Uh, did I work on the Sabbath? And they said no, so I gave them my two weeks' notice. So then I went to Alabama and went to school. And got down there and wanted to... I got a job at Group City Hospital. Which, but now, I have a cousin who's one of the uh, department heads said He went off to uh, the famous medical school in uh, Minnesota, uh, John Hopkins or what it was, and came back and now he's a department head in some radiology or something. But anyway, I went to Druid City Hospital. Asked them, can I get off on the Sabbath? They said no. And by this time I was married. They said, well, if I don't have a job, I'm not going to feed my wife. And they had any children by that time. But uh, anyway, they said no, so we had that job. People gave us food and I borrowed money and uh, we made it somehow. I had saved a little bit of money from working in Chrysler, so I had enough car payments and so forth. So, again, that's two jobs I quit for keeping the seven. Like I say, I feel about this big, because God says this bit doesn't take much longer than 50 years. <laughs> so 50 years is no time compared to what the seven did. Yet, uh, again, remember my granddaughter is saying, well, how do we know it's not uh, Sunday? Why couldn't God just say, uh, go to church on Saturday? But again, if you look in the Bible, it says the seventh day. And it didn't say a seventh day, because you go to the radio preachers and all this, and there was Sunday is the seventh day, so they say the sack was every seven days, so they're again adding two. So once again, it's the seventh day. And uh, before closing, I'll. Uh, Give a few of my personal involvements with the Sabbath day. And quite a few things have happened with me that have been important on the Sabbath. I was baptized on the Sabbath. I was there in Alabama going to school and it out to Pasadena and a minister did come visit me there in Tuscaloosa. <coughs> but uh, he just said, well, at that time they were screaming us pretty closely. So and said, well, I'll go back to, when he lived in Mobile, this was Albert Atlas, he went back to Mobile and said, well, I'll write you. So he wrote me a letter saying, it might be good for you to go to Birmingham and hear uh, a Mr. Meredith speak. <coughs> if you get a chance to do that, then write me a letter, then I'll write you back. So I went and heard Mr. Meredith in Birmingham, and then wrote me a letter saying I had gone and heard Mr. Meredith, and I was still interested in becoming part of the church. So he wrote me and said that if I had a chance, and a way to drive down the Mobile and come to Sabbath services and we'll counsel. And that's what I did. Uh, I was married by the time, so I, my wife and I drove down the Mobile, went to Sabbath services, and after that we counseled, Ms. Adams and myself, and I was baptized on the Sabbath. I drove 200 miles from Tuscaloosa down the Mobile, attended the services. After we counseled, he baptized me there. So again, that happened on the Sabbath. reading some of the other books, H. Jubilees and Enoch and uh, uh, various books that are 
kind of along with the Bible, but uh, without quoting any of them, Jubilee is a 50th year. And if you read in uh, Jubilees and in Deuteronomy, it tells you 50 years is kind of a, a turning point. God blesses you there. So I'm already getting some blessings this year, my 50th year. I got a blessing first that would have, uh, as far as I know, it's already done half of it, but it will finance my whole feast. My room is already taken care of. Oh, two rooms, I had two rooms. And uh, I can pay it over a period of time. I don't have to pay it all at once. And I'm going to be planning to go to Indianapolis, fly with my daughter and her three grandchildren. And by the way, thank you for your prayers. Uh, Serenity, my granddaughter, great, my great granddaughter, uh, is doing 98% better, she said, about an hour ago. So she had that bug bite and was swollen and looked just looked terrible, but she said she's 98% better now. So anyway, as I said, the blessings have started. It started, I, I don't know when they started, but they, they're here now because, uh, and I went to see my granddaughter and the three grandbabies about a month ago, and just before I went, it was unsolicited, but I got an offer from a company that would finance up to $10,000 worth of credit. And you pay it back on a time basis that reduced uh, interest. So they haven't even sent me a bill yet, but my room down at uh, Branson's already paid for. I'm going to go back online probably this coming week and get the airline tickets and the car rental. I'm going to fly. I'm going to go to Indianapolis. I'm going to fly from Indianapolis to Springfield and planning to rent a car there for the whole eight days, even though we probably won't need it. Everything's right there on the, in the area. So this uh, company will pay for the whole thing, and I can just pay them over a long period of time and not have to worry about getting in debt or borrowing or anything like this. So that was one. Then I, this past week I received another blessing. So again, 50th year. Again, when you read Deuteronomy and some of those about the Jubilee year and so forth, God promises the release you from debts and things like this. So those are just extra things that you see in the Bible and in the extra books and things if you read them. So I'm taking uh, God for His work word, and I told my granddaughter the same thing, so she's all excited, so I was able to send her a little bit of extra money this past week, so uh, she said, I'm so excited, and so forth, so again, God, it seems to be that uh, it's going on, so I uh, again was in 19, 2006, on the Sabbath day, at the last great day, after I had driven from Montgomery, Indiana, I had to stroke. And then uh, two years ago, on the Sabbath day, because I was ordained the deacon. So many things have happened to me on the Sabbath day. And when do I speak and tell everybody that I know in the way that I can that uh, God is great and He's blessed me? Today is the Sabbath. So the Sabbath means a lot for me in many ways. Like I said, uh, I wasn't born on the Sabbath, so that, that, that's the out of the question. But still, it's been 50 years starting... Uh, well, as Mr. Armstrong used to say, he's in his something year, so I'm in my 50th year. So, 2015 will be the 50th year, completely <laughs> of the 50th year. So, God is giving me some blessings and ask my granddaughter to watch it. Sure enough, within the day or two after me telling her that, I got some other blessings. Like I said, I did not solicit the company that sent me the, the invitation to uh, borrow the money and so forth as needed. So, I went online and did that. So... Things are going on. So again, that's my personal involvement. So and the uh, last little comment, although I, I didn't keep time, but I used to go way over time. But uh, I remember when I went to Indianapolis last year, talking to Mr. Gooch about the Sabbath. God says you take a delight. <laughs> Uh, read Psalms 1, verse 2. Psalms 1, verse 2. I think this is worth, uh, worth reading. Several of them in this book. Where David says, and he says it in several different ways. Psalm 1, verse 2. 
But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And it gets a little bit more specific. Psalm 119, 16, 35, and 47. Psalm 119, 16. One nineteen sixteen reads, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget your word. One nineteen thirty five. Psalm 119, verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. For therein do I delight. So it takes a delight. And 47. And this is what I was talking to uh, Mr. Gooch about in uh, Indianapolis. The Sabbath I come, I tell him, I say, I live in St. Louis, and on the Sabbath I have to go way out on the long bus ride. It's just a break from the whole uh, week of things. And I just get a break and ride the bus and just sit and meditate. Verse 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. And there are a couple more, I'm not sure where, there was one that says he delights in God's Sabbath, but still. As I said, Mr. Gooch and his wife took me back to the bus station, and he allowed me to speak there in Indianapolis, and I just said, no, what is really, it was a beautiful day that day. So what a delight the Sabbath is for me because it's a break from my usual routine. Even though the years when I was working, it was always a delight to get away from everything on the Sabbath day and just to enjoy it. So again, God says you are to take a delight in His Sabbath day. And as I said, for me right now, and I don't know how much more is coming, but uh, as my granddaughter was jumping up and down the other week, and as I mentioned, uh, she said uh, serenity is 98% better now, so things happen, you're going to have trials. But with 50 years, still keeping the Sabbath, and God seems to be blessing me, and what, what's to come in the future, I do not know, except... Uh, now, this will be about the fifth feast that uh, Quintessa has gone with me to, about four different states, because she went to Iowa with me, uh, the Davenport, the Watt Cities. She went to Montgomery two or three times, went down to the Ozarks. So, and Oklahoma, so she's been to the peace before, so it's not like something new to her. But for all three children now, Kamaya was blessed in Montgomery, but the other two little girls had never been to the peace. And all my, my two girls, all my grandchildren, and just about all my great-grandchildren have been to the feast for the blessing of the little children. And it's like uh, Alton says, he used to take his uh, children up every year. But you were here last year. He said, okay, we're going to bless them again. So he take them up for blessing every year. <laughs> so anyway, my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren have all gone to the feast and all had a blessing. So, uh, and usually that's on the last great day, which is usually a Sabbath. So again, a Sabbath is a delight as far as I'm concerned with God. And uh, if you take God's law as a delight, and he will bless you. And I'm really interested to see what's going to happen because Quintessa and the three girls are planning to go with me to the feast this year, and that will be a blessing. This will be one of the greatest feasts ever. And uh, looking forward, it will be all, in effect, all paid for even before we get there. So that, that will make it even more delightful. So again, keep the Sabbath. Today it started out raining. I just on my cell phone before I came and said it was supposed to be raining all day today. So it's a little break in the weather now. So just enjoy the Sabbath and knowing that God never sleeps, and he will uh, bless you as he gets ready. So have a delightful rest of the Sabbath.
the religion that is left is distorted and defiled at best. <laughs> the Bible is full of examples. Turn your back on God, fail to obey His commands, and you will suffer. Provoke Him to anger, and you will be destroyed. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to err, or lead you astray, and destroy the way of your past. Our leaders are causing people to go astray. Because instead of leading to God, they're leading people away from God. Unwise decisions, unwise judgments, state after state is passing same-sex marriage, and state after state is having a world of problems. Drought, forest fires, and floods all over the nation at the same time. California is in the midst, they said, of an 11-year drought continuing to get worse, and they just announced this morning that if it continues, and I think they named like six states are going to have to reuse their water. So it's not getting any better if things don't change. Verse 4 says, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Now, actually, the word babes there doesn't mean babes. If you look it up, it's the Bolger called it capricious ones. But what it means is people who change their mind for no apparent reason <coughs> on a whim. In other words, they say one thing and do another. And that's who our leaders are. They say one thing today, tomorrow they say something else. They, there's no plan. Isaiah chapter 5 <coughs> and verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. They think they are so wise, even to go so far as to compare this movement that is about with the Civil Rights Acts of the 60s. But as I mentioned before, those civil rights of the 60s did not go against God's law. It was a matter of changing man's laws that man had put into action that was not good. And people realized that, people fought against it, they marched against it, they brought to people's attention, and the laws were changed. But they didn't go against God's law, but that's what we have now. Verse 24, Therefore, as the fire devoured the stubble and the flame consumed the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness, and their blossom will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts, and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. And we're seeing fires and fires and more fires. And it's just, it just compounds the problem when the state of California and Washington and Oregon and Nevada are having forest fires that they're fighting. And they have to use the water that they don't have to put out fires. Therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were his refuge in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So he will lift up a banner to the nations from afar, and he will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely 
They shall come with speed, swiftly. And that's going to be the end result when nations come over here and take over. And they're already doing that subtly. We were stopped by a train yesterday. We went to town and do all of our running around. And the train comes by. And we have to sit our way for the train to go by. And we're one of these long freight trains. And I'm looking at all the containers. China, China. China, China, China. One after another, after another, after another, after another. All China. China's got us. You know, they're they're we're buying China. We're 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 paying China for everything. China's gonna own us if we keep going. And in fact there was a uh, an article on the uh, GTA website that said that China thinks they can defeat the United States in a war. So, where are we headed? How far are we away from it? Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth, I hate. If there's anything that you ever want to hate, you know, you get to where you really want to hate something, it's evil. That's what you want to hate. God says he hates evil. And of course, evil is defined by the opposite of his law and what's good. Psalm 34. And verse 13, he says, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The uh, preachers should be preaching that and let the people know, hey, don't demonstrate, don't march, seek peace. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and say such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. It isn't easy to do right and to speak right. And they're making it harder and harder to do so. You may suffer for it. But God will be there for you. His eyes and his ears are on you. You're the righteous. You do what he says. He pays attention to you. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 15. You know all the blessings and the cursings. Verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all of his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, cursed shall you be in the country. Verse 20, The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke, and all that you set your hand to do, until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly, because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning, fever, 
with the sword, with scorching, with mildew, they shall pursue you until you perish. And your heavens which are over you, over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be like iron. And that's what we got right now in the West. Now I forget how many square miles of California is not going to be farmed next year. They said there's, there's no reason for it. It's, just, it's all dirt. There's no water. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. And that's the way that we're headed. How far are we from all this? Will the weather, weather patterns change or will they continue? And will things continue to get worse? They say like 40% of our produce comes from California. And now they're talking about square miles that they're not going to farm. So how long will it take before the problems continue to get worse? <clears throat> Verse 20, he says, the Lord will send on you confusion. Why? Because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. Our leaders are confused. God says he was sent confusion, and our leaders are confused because they have forsaken God. <laughs> How are they confused? By spinning. By spinning. I'm sure all of you have heard, but probably uh, have forgotten about the gay Bible. Now, this was brought to my attention, so <clears throat> I thought I would bring it to yours. I'm going to read a little bit of this uh, editor's notes from the Queen James Bible. <laughs> I'm just going to read part of this. This is pretty long, but I, I just so you get the idea and you get the point you know where all this is coming from. We chose the 1769 form of the King James Bible for our revision for the following reasons. Number one, the obvious gay link to King James. Known amongst friends and courtiers as Queen James because of the many gay lovers. So that's why they chose it. Well, what did one thing have to do with the other? It wasn't his Bible. All he did was commission people that translated into English. Most English Bible translations that actively condemn homosexuality have based themselves on the King James Version and have erroneously adapted its words to support their own agenda. But we wanted to return to the clean source and start there. Some claim the language of the King James Version is antiquated, but we believe it is poetic, traditional, and ceremonial. <clears throat> Christianity is an ancient tradition, and the King James and resultant Queen James versions remind us and keep us connected to that tradition. So Christianity is a tradition, like the tradition of the elders. Now all this time you thought it was a way of life. It's just a tradition. <clears throat> what we change. The Bible says nothing about homosexuality. interpreted in different ways, leading to what we call interpretive ambiguity. In editing the Queen James Bible, we were faced with the decision to modify existing language, or simply to delete it. Well, they didn't want to delete it, so they chose to change it. Now, I, just, I read through some of it, you'll see where they're coming from. Okay. 
We also refuse to say that's outdated and omit something. Yes, things like the book of Leviticus are horribly outdated. So why are you bothering to go to the feast? And why are the Jews keeping atonement and Passover and Feast of Trumpets? It's horribly outdated. Because they only read two verses out of Leviticus. But, that doesn't stop people from citing them. We want in our Bible bulletproof from the ones shooting the bullets. So you see the picture they're painting. <clears throat> We're good, you're bad, you're trying to harm us. That's where it's coming from. We need protection. We edited the Bible to prevent homophobic interpretations. Now, I claim they only changed eight verses. Now, I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, <clears throat> so you'll get an idea. Genesis 19, 5 says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came unto you this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. King James Version. Their version. And they called unto Lot and said unto them, Where are the men which came unto you this night? Bring them out unto us that we may rape them and humiliate them. Because what they believe is that the sin committed in Sodom wasn't gay sex, it was rape. And there's a difference. Okay, to address Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13, we need to look at the path of translation. The Hebrew word, toiva, from which abomination is translated, simply means that it is ritually unclean or a taboo. That's how they describe the word, abomination. But the Jewish Bible, the complete Jewish Bible, uses the word abomination. After all, it's their language. They ought to know what it most closely represents, right? And if you look into Strong's Concordance and Vine's Bible uh, dictionary, uh, the very first word in Vine's is abomination. The very first word in their dictionary. And Vine's is a long definition of Strong's. One or two word definition. It tells you different places where it was used and in what way it was used. And it, 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 they uh, go along, you know, abomination, it's detestable, you know, hated by God for this reason or that reason. It's not just taboo. Well, <clears throat> given the definition of the Hebrew word uh, in Leviticus, we suggest that by today's standards, a biblical abomination would be understood to be scandalous. So it's not abomination, it's just scandalous. Keep in mind, a biblical abomination by Levitical standards would be scandalous for a Jewish priest. Leviticus, a holiness code for Jewish priests. Now, what was wrong with that statement? You see what they don't understand? Leviticus was a code for Levi, not for Judah. Levi was where the priest came from, not Jewish priests. <laughs> Furthermore, we don't believe homosexual relations to be taboo, so we found a much more elegant solution. Yeah. Elegant. <laughs> Choosing our words, aren't they? Oh, All right. We therefore changed Leviticus. And their, their explanation is that it, 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 uh, it all had to do with pagan worship in pagan temples and nothing else. So the way they changed it was, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. So they changed it to, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind in the temple of Moloch, it is an abomination. Meaning everywhere else it's okay, just don't do it in their temple. 
Don't don't do it to an idol. Don't do the idol worship. Well, then they go on and they go to Romans one. Anti uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender Bible interpretations cite women did change their natural use in that which is against nature. This would actually support <clears throat> Romans one twenty eight. While the women were occupied with unnatural uses of their bodies, which could even have meant pagan dancing. We really have no idea. That's their explanation. It could have meant pagan dancing. I mean, come on. <clears throat> okay. So what they did, they just took those verses, didn't take out any words. They just rearranged them. Put them in a different order, which is what? Spin. They just mix them up, put them in a different order. Well, here it goes. Most scholars, us included, agree that the sin in Romans 1 isn't being gay or lesbian or having gay sex. The sin was worshiping pale idols instead of God. Pagan idols. The interesting thing is they're quoting. Romans 1, and they're calling themselves scholars, most scholars, us included. And right out of Romans 1, it says what? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's really all you need to say. I had to go to a long explanation here on several other things, other verses. And it's just a matter of, you know, like I said, word, word games. Uh, but the last one that we, we get to is the one that talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, all the way to the other end, in Jude. As they call it, right? <clears throat> Jude chapter 1, verse 7. But you know there's no chapter in Jude. Okay, and it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth in the example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. All right, you ready for this one? <clears throat> Given our clarification of the story of Sodom, we chose to highlight the fact that the male mob in Sodom raped angels which is strange and that it is not human. Those poor, helpless, defenseless angels raped by a male mom. <laughs> Professing themselves to be wise, they became stupid. <laughs> and that's just how bad it is. That's incredible. Yeah. So they changed that verse to read, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after non-human flesh. Did you know that an angel was flesh? <laughs> Are set forth in the example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. <coughs> well, yeah. what, what, what can you say? Well, what was that thing they say about <clears throat> you can leave it as a question or you can <clears throat> remove all doubt? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it is. <clears throat> Absolutely. That's but incredible. understanding those things, okay, how they change that yeah. and their understanding and what they believe is what is leading to what is happening today in the news. I want to read this to you from our website. President Obama signed an executive order Monday barring federal contractors from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, ignoring the pleas of Christian and other faith leaders to include an exemption for religious organizations. Thanks to your passion and advocacy and the irrefutable rightness of your cause, our government, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, will become just a little bit fairer, the president told a gathering in the White House. He might as well have said, 
our government, the government of the gay people, by the gay people, and for the gay people. Because that's what he was portraying. The executive order would prevent Christian and other religious organizations with federal contracts from requiring workers to adhere to the tenets of their religious beliefs. Christianity Today reports the order could impact religious nonprofits such as World Vision, World Relief, and Catholic Charities. The mask is coming off the homosexual movement's agenda. They really do not believe in religious liberty. They want forced affirmation of homosexual and transgender conduct to trump every other consideration in the workplace, including religious liberty. Vice President Joe Biden went so far as to declare as much in his speech to the international gay rights activists. I don't care what your culture is, he said in remarks covered by the Associated Press. Inhumanity is inhumanity. Prejudice is prejudice is prejudice. That explains why a Christian baker in Colorado was ordered by a state commission to undergo re-education training after he declined to participate in a gay wedding celebration. That explains why a Christian photographer in New Mexico was found guilty of discrimination for refusing to photograph a gay wedding ceremony. And as I detailed in God Bless America, that explains why Billy Graham, America's pastor, was subjected to an Internal Revenue Service audit after he supported a traditional marriage amendment in North Carolina. There are people who are willing to use whatever means necessary to force religious institutions to conform to new sexual morality. Any movement or institution that refuses to comply will have to face the consequences. So what is the next logical step in the government's systematic effort to marginalize Christianity? Robert Jeffries, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, suggests to me that churches might want to pay close attention to their tax-exempt status. The problem with this executive order is that it paves the way for the next one, which could withhold tax-exempt status or broadcast licenses for religious organizations holding biblical beliefs, which the administration disagrees. And what is the end result of that? The prophecy, famine of the hearing of the word. When you can't get a broadcast license to be on radio or television with your religious program. Because you don't agree with their agenda. And that's where we're headed. And we're just a matter of steps away from it. Because as I was just reading, nobody's in a big uproar. They're just disappointed that they didn't include this or that clause. That's where we're headed. So with all the spin on certain scriptures, is it any wonder why our leaders are so confused? We have stepped back 2,000 years. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and you're all familiar with this, but for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They don't want you to know the truth. They're holding the truth down. They're suppressing it. So what do we do? Well, we just, we go along with the agenda and a Queen James Bible. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes are thoroughly seen by being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. 
who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up through vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their errors, which was due. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, calling evil good. It's no wonder they can't think straight. No pun intended. Isaiah chapter 3, once again. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 8. For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The look on their countenance witnesses against them. I was watching the other night Wheel of Fortune. And they had this guy on there, just, he looked a little funny. Okay, he looked like a big sissy. Yeah. <laughs> and did you want to say hello to anybody in the audience? I like to say hello to my husband. Yeah. Oh, I said, well, that makes you the wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I don't know how the host can, can, can stand it, you know, I just... And, and that's, you can't discriminate because of the law, see? And it's getting worse and worse. And yet, that's what they're faced with. they got to put up with that. And, what does the Bible say? They're looking under conscience, witnesses against them. He's witnessing against himself. They declare their sin is Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they are brought evil upon themselves. They don't hide it. They declare it on national television. I know why. I mean, we're looking at prophecy being fulfilled. That this is what is happening. And our country is going to be suffering far. Because everybody is going to suffer when these things getting into place. You know, just be glad that God's eyes and ears are on the righteous. Okay, now with all that information, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Psalm, or Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 19. <coughs> Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? So, what are they talking about? Marriage. Which is between a man and a woman. This is what we're talking about. What was Jesus' response? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Because they are male and female, that is the reason for marriage. That's exactly what he just said. For this reason. Because that's the way they were created. In verse 6. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. God has joined male and female in marriage and nothing else. Just that simple. Now, Hebrews adds to this in one verse in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, 
but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Marriage, which we just read, is between a man and a woman, is honorable. In every other situation, the bed is defiled and God will judge. So then, God says today what he has always said, repent. That's what he said. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 9. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor harmful sexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If they had done these things, they repented and did them no more. And were baptized. And that's the message. Not to parade and be proud of your sin, but to repent and to have them washed away. Our leaders are following the lead of fools. The blind lead the blind, and they both fall into the ditch, and everybody else follows them right in there too. We may have entered the beginning of sorrows. I'm going to close by going back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And verse 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. All you need there is the Queen James Bible. They're saying Jesus is the Christ, and they're deceiving millions of people by their lives, by their spin. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. Well, this has you know, been going on for a long time, off and on, off and on. But what we have today is we have wars and rumors of wars in various parts of the, of the world. You have it in the Middle East. Just had another round with Israel and and Hamas. You have it with Syria and their freedom fighters over there, as they want to call themselves. And you have ISIS and the Shiites in Iraq and the Kurds. And they said this morning that 80 of those uh, uh, Hasidis, is that what they're called, were killed. 80 of the men were killed this morning. Uh, you have nation against nation. You have Ukraine and Russia. Russia says they were sending some supplies, and Ukraine says, we don't believe you, and they started blowing up the supplies because they figured they were trying to smuggle in troops and ammunition. So you have wars and rumors of wars. You have nation <laughs> against nation. Famines, again, it just started in California. 40% of our produce comes from California. <coughs> it's going to get less and less, and the prices are going to go up and up. And that's just here. 
I mean, we talk worldwide, you already know there's families in all, all kinds of other nations in the world. Pestilence. <coughs> well, unless you haven't had the news on, you've never heard about Ebola. And what's been going on with that? And it's spreading because of the wars in Africa. It's spreading from nation to nation in Africa. And, of course, two of the scientists were brought here with it. They claim there's no cure, but they really don't know that much about it from a disease standpoint. They just know that, well, sometimes you get better, sometimes you don't. That's just one disease that everybody's concerned about. But pestilence is widespread. You have insects that are causing, you know, they're still concerned about all the honeybees that are dying because of the insects that are killing them. You have just your regular everyday diseases. You have cancer, heart disease. All these things are on the rise. Well, they try to come up with more medications and more treatments because they're treating the symptoms rather than the cause. And everything just keeps getting worse. And we have all the other diseases that we were reading about back in Deuteronomy. Consumption, fevers, Earthquakes in various places. Well, last week you heard there was an earthquake in Hawaii while there was a hurricane in Hawaii. That's what you call a double whammy. And then there was, I forget how many earthquakes they've had in Oklahoma. They're all small. But what are they leading up to? And of course, earthquakes are everywhere. They had had one bad one, I think, in China this last week. And so, all these, he says, are the beginning of sorrows. It's just the beginning of the labor pains. He says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. They're going to start killing Christians. It's in the news. It's happening in many different nations. It's happening. It's happening in Iraq. It's happening in Africa. And it's spreading. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. <coughs> and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. All we have to do is look at Ferguson and see how easily that can spread. How easily it could get out of control and spread. We wonder sometimes what what's going to happen, how we're going to, how this nation is going to fall. See how easy it could happen. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Well, if things continue the way they are, the time of the two witnesses may be near. And then all will know, thanks to social media, and they will continue to call good evil and evil good as the beast comes on the scene. And the false prophet with them. And they deceive the whole world and believe, calling people to believe that they are the good ones. And the two witnesses are the evil. Because the Bible says they're going to 
send gifts and make merry when they're finally killed because these two tormented those who lived on the earth. And they're going to be happy and excited and rejoice because the beast and the false prophet won and defeated those two evil people. And they'll continue to call good evil and evil good because they're, and they will be, deceived. How far are we from these events? How close are they? All you can do is keep watching. Is keep watching and see what happens. The Bible says to watch and to pray. That you will be kind and worthy to escape all these things. And that's all we can do. We are at <coughs> mercy. But God says, His eyes and His ears are on the righteous. So no matter how hard it becomes, and how difficult they make it for you, you have to continue to do and say what is right in God's eyes.